Well, good evening and welcome back to the Journey Home program. I'm your host, John Mark Grodi, and once again, we just have this wonderful opportunity to sit down and grab a cup of coffee and listen to a story. Uh, God's story. God's story worked out in the lives of his children, and we're joined tonight by Dr Trey Plummer. He's a former Southern Baptist preacher. Uh, and, a, and a barber. We talked about that beforehand. Welcome, Trey. Thanks for having me. I'm excited to hear you got some neat parts of your story we were talking about beforehand. Um, but it's just great to have you here. It's a pleasure to be here. Out from Arkansas in the, in and the rain. third time's a charm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We've been trying to get you a couple times. We've had to cancel, but great to finally have you out. Yeah, good to be here. Yeah. Okay. Well, let's let's step way back and, and talk about where your story begins, your spiritual journey. Oh, where to start? Uh, yeah. <laughs> really, it's probably different every time I I tell my conversion story depending yeah. on who asks. Uh, yeah. I think it was uh, Walker Percy that said a, a smart mouth question deserves a smart mouth answer. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I try not to do that, but you do get people that kind of uh, ask these questions out of like incredulous, just kind of exasperation, like why would anybody do that? Right. You know? And then the other side of that is you, you do have people from time to time that that ask questions that are more inquiry based, like, why did you do that? You know, they want to they want to know more because yeah. maybe they're on their own spiritual journey. And then, and then I have Catholics that, and there's two different spectrums of that too. Uh, you'll meet Catholics that they're like, uh, they don't even really put Christian and Catholic in their own minds together, mm -hmm. and so like, why? Well, why did you why did you come over to our team? And then other people, you meet converts and stuff. So. It's kind of different uh, not being interrupted, maybe, <laughs> and uh, being able to tell it uh, from the beginning. And I don't really even know where to start. Um, uh, I grew up uh, in a little town I still live in, and it is deep. I, I tell people that it has uh, got to be like a rhinestone on the belt buckle of the Bible belt. <laughs> and I usually make the joke that there are more churches than Christians. but. Uh, I'll preface everything I say that if I poke fun at my Protestant brothers and sisters, it's it's from a place of love and respect because yeah. that is still part of my identity in a way, and especially with my formation and how I was raised. Yeah. But I was raised in a in a Southern Baptist home. Uh, my mother was uh, raised Nazarene, and my father was Southern Baptist, and so there was a little bit of tension there. My mother had to be rebaptized to join that faith tradition when they were married. And I think that that was kind of a point of contention for them. And so I think maybe some of those conversations just kind of left a, a coolness there. That's something maybe I tried to perceive as I got older, but they encouraged me to go to church. And I would either go with one or the other set of grandparents. So I grew up going to a Free Will Baptist church some Sundays, and a Southern Baptist church, others. And uh, I finally landed on the Southern Baptist church for my own home because they had the, the exciting youth group. <laughs> <laughs> and if you're a teenager in rural America, that's where all the social action happens. Right. So, uh, and I, you know, as, as an adult looking back and talking to people, I think I kind of took it for granted how um, fifth quarter, which was this after football games on Friday night, the youth group would go to the church and have this kind of service. But, I mean, I thought everybody did that sort of right. stuff, but <laughs> it's not quite the case. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I was really involved in, in the youth group, and I had an amazing mentor, a guy named Warren Gassaway, and he's, he's actually still very involved with the uh, Southern Baptist Convention in, in Arkansas. He's, he's on the board of directors or in some sort of leadership capacity now. But uh, he was a seminary student while he was our youth pastor, and he would take the things that they were talking about, and he would, like I used to say when I was preaching, he'd put the cookies on the bottom shelf to, so the kids could get to them. You yeah. know, he would. He was a, a master, a graduate student in theology, and I think that that kind of inculcated that early spirit of of inquiry. Yeah, and so. Going through my high school years, um, there were there were all these different um, activities and events that we would go to, where people would make these uh, kind of emotional uh, uh, 
professions of, of God calling them to, to this or to that. And I think it was somewhere later in high school that I don't, I don't remember the, the exact hymn or how it all went, but the preacher was preaching and uh, given an altar call and said, if God's calling you to something in your life, then maybe it's time for you to step out in faith and, and, and ask Him what to do next. And I felt this overwhelming desire to, um, to preach. And I think that that was, you know, it's just something that had grown through that um, growing up in the youth group. And long about that time, <clears throat> I was dating this girl that I've now been married to for 16 years. And uh, she was from another faith tradition. She grew up Assemblies of God. And so we kind of, I, I kind of left the church I grew up in, and we kind of both started growing to this, going to this little uh, country church, but it was still a Southern Baptist church. I mean, up to this point, had, had you had much of a sense of, the, of the, there being a unique theology to your, your Baptist tradition, or was it just... <clears throat> so, I'm like, we can yeah. Get, yeah, we can go to there. So about the time I graduated and I went to the um, University of Arkansas uh, in Fort Smith, I had a, a Ph.D. professor, of course it's public university, and I took Old Testament survey and I took New Testament survey with him. And he was a Methodist minister, Dr. Charles Armour is his name. And uh, that was when I really first started bumping up against oh, everybody's not a fundamentalist where, you know, it's the earth is only 6,000 years old or, <laughs> you know. So I, I had never really thought really outside of the, the Southern Baptist sure. tradition up until that point in time. And, and he was talking about like historical criticism, some of these different um, ways of, of looking at Scripture that I had never really come up against. And, and it really kind of started this decade-long kind of deconstruction period, I think is the way that some people put that. Mm -hmm. But during that time, I had got, we got, I got married right after graduated from high school. My wife's a few years older than I am. And uh, we, we had a baby about, uh, about a year later, our first baby. And um, we were still going to church together. And then I started preaching. And I was a supply preacher. So a lot of times we were at a different church just every Sunday. So I'm dealing with that whole kind of deconstruction thing, right? Sure. And at that time, I had I had read uh, C.S. Lewis's Mere Christianity. And I'd kind of, you know, where the analogy where he talks about the hallway and then the different rooms coming off the hall, and whereas the rooms kind of represent like the different traditions, and the hallway is kind of the things that we have that, that hold us together as Christians. And I'd kind of worked myself out of the room that I was in into the hallway, mm -hmm. right? And I was just kind of camping there, even though I was preaching. So, because I, I had these different opportunities to preach at, I see, I preached at Free Will Baptist churches. I preached at several different charismatic type churches. I preached at um, uh, Methodist churches. I actually, at one point in time, kind of went through an inquiry process on uh, becoming a Methodist minister. Um, but ultimately, I. I stayed with my my roots, and then I ended up pastoring uh, Southern Baptist churches, Evening Shade Baptist Church, little country church, uh -huh. about sixty people, um, and I was there for about a year, and that was about two thousand and nine, I think. We're talking tonight to Trey Plummer, former Southern Baptist preacher. I just wanted to ask uh, for a moment before you went on again. It's it's neat that you got into preaching, and, you know, and and. Um, being, being a, what do you say, a supply preacher? A supply, that's what we call them, yeah. Yeah, I mean, talk just for a moment about, about that. Is that, you said you, you felt that call. Mm -hmm. Were you always kind of a public speaker, or what was, is it just something you were good at, you had a passion for, or how, how did that Yeah, I, I really have no idea. I, well, so I had, a, I had a little bit of a drama background when mm -hmm. I was in, in school. I did, you know, school plays and stuff like that, and so I was always kind of a I guess probably a little bit of a narcissist. <laughs> Didn't mind getting up in front of people. Mm -hmm. uh, played a little bit of music and stuff like that. And so it didn't bother me to get up in front of people. Now it's it's not something that I want yeah. or desire at all. But um, yeah, I just, I did. I just kind of had this overwhelming desire to, um, and 
And the more I went on, it kind of morphed into more of like a teaching uh, type of preaching, right. more kind of, a, and, I, and I really found kind of my, my fit whenever we were doing things that weren't like the church service, but more of the Bible study type stuff is right. where I really enjoyed those yeah. more intimate kind of things. But yeah, nice. the supply preacher thing is mm-hmm. basically you get put on this list and any time a preacher goes on vacation or, or something, they give you a call. And I was like the only one <laughs> for, for our little uh, association. And there was like, I don't know, 30, 40 churches, just in just all real rural churches. And mm-hmm. so I would get a call, like I said, you know, maybe maybe 40 Sundays out of the year. And I did that for five, six, seven years, wow. probably. At the same time as you're going through this sort of de- deconstruction period where you're at, working through yeah, some questions. At, at the same time, because like I said, I was kind of, um, I was kind of pulling away maybe from some of the, not that I'd had like this deep philosophical or theological difference, but I could, I could see the value in other traditions. Mm-hmm. And I, I especially did like the, the Methodist tradition. I liked the structure of a kind of liturgy, you know, and um, kind of kind of looking back, and I can kind of break my conversion into two phases. And so the first phase is kind of part of that deconstruction period. And, and a part of that is where I, I actually started viewing Catholicism as a Christian tradition mm-hmm. because they were so easily dismissed up till that point in time. I had no reference point. I thought, you know, well, Catholics worship Mary. They don't worship God. We'll, we can get to that a little bit later. Yeah, but yeah. Um, through the through the the Methodist Church, I would supply for this. She was a, a lady preacher, and she would bring me the stuff that you know. You know, we had like the the order of service, mm-hmm. and they they followed the liturgical calendar, and so the readings were the same. And uh, she would got, kind of go through it with me whenever I would fill in for her, and. She said, now we, we read the creed before every service. And she said, now when you get to Catholic, that just means universal, because she knew that would freak me out. You know? and, I, <laughs> and I thought, well, universal body of Christ. And so, yeah, I can, I can get on board with that. So like I said, I was camped in the hall. I could see the value in these different traditions. My wife and I had different traditions growing up. And so we were trying to kind of forge our own path together. Right. And so we made a lot of turns uh, along the way and, and explored a lot of different uh, traditions. Of course, I never stepped outside of the Christian tradition. but And I think that's something specific for um, people that go through what they call like a deconstruction period. A lot of them end up like leaving the faith. Right. But I never, I never doubted my relationship with Christ. Yeah. Um, I didn't, I'd, he'd been too intimate of, of a relationship. There was uh, too many, too many moments in my life where I, I, I knew that God had, had moved or worked or, or touched me in this way or that way. And right. so there was never, there was never this moment that I thought, you know, I'm, I'm leaving Christianity. It was just, which family do I fit? Which one of these doors yeah. do I go through? And, right? and why is this big family, that, that central stream, yeah. why is this big family broken up in the way that it is? Yeah, yeah. yeah. And you know, even Protestants, they can't, they can't really. We say we've got a common thread, but I mean, you've got this distinction between well, when does baptism happen? Is it right. believers' baptism, or is it, you know, baptism for infants, or you know, communion? We're all over the board on that. And then you, you try to get somebody to condense it down to well, what's essential? Right. Well, everybody's got a different definition of that. Well, in between those two that you brought up, sort of Baptist and Methodism, there's a there's a there's a difference in theological spiritual emphasis in mm-hmm. terms of what it what it looks like to live out the Christian life, right? In mm-hmm. terms of Baptist, was, was there an emphasis on kind of what the once saved always saved in your Baptist? Oh, tradition? absolutely, and that was something that always bothered me. Even the language of "I got saved," right? Like this, not that there there and there is, I think, a, a point of conversion that all of us can look back yeah, to. Yeah. But just kind of leaving it there was what was always bothersome to me. And even even as a Baptist, I would say, well, I have been saved, I'm being saved, and I hope to be saved, right? right? And and so I, and that's 
that's pretty Catholic for even even from from early on. So, right. yeah. And there's a bit more of an emphasis emphasis again in, in Methodism on the the ongoing the, the need to grow yeah. and, and go deepen and yeah. be be transformed over time in Christ. Um, it, it's been it's been a long time since I've uh, looked into the uh, I can't even remember the the sure. Book of Discipline. I think yeah. is what it, John Wesley's book, but um, I think that the the Methodists actually teach this um, growing to a place of uh, I forget what what we call it exactly, sure. but where like a, a sinless state. You know, you're working towards that. Not that it's ever, but Baptists are a little bit more comfortable with right. <laughs> you know, once we're there, we're there. Right. So and so that's why again you say you're in that middle stream looking mm -hmm. around, and there's there's a, attractive things in these different groups. Yeah, right. There's yeah, and, and and really. There's people in each tradition that make compelling arguments for for each of these different traditions. So, it, you kind of bump up against, uh, you know, where where do I need to where do I need to be at? So. Right. Right. So you're in that in that period. Uh, you're now married. So what what happens? How does that period continue? Well, we added okay. uh, another child two years after the first one, and then. Uh, Four years after that, we added the third, and one of the the first journey home trip I was supposed to make I missed because we just added our fourth. <laughs> but um, during all that, um, my wife and I we we've been on the same page this whole process. It's wonderful. Um, and actually, I can blame conversion on her to some extent. Um, you know, we're working towards that part of the story, mm -hmm. but. Um, I think looking back with with small children, uh, she was she was dragging our kids around as I was preaching at all these different churches, and uh, I think that I'm more kind of head led, more the intellectual side of things sometimes, and she's more kind of heart led, more kind of the emotional. Maybe that's kind of coming from our different traditions, but she um, she always encouraged me to preach and was on board with that, but. Um, I think that we both kind of had this feeling of displacement. So that was uh, maybe, I don't want to say discontentment, right? But never really felt like we fit into wherever we were finding ourselves. Right, right. So I don't know if we need to get... Well, go ahead. Yeah, well, I was going to say, for, you know, from there, obviously, so you're, you're, you're looking around, there's a sense of discontentment, a sense of, you know, Unease, like what? What begins to open you up to the possibility of that? There might be a, a definite place to go, or I need to figure out what is the right spot. What What's the turning point there? Well, as far as Catholicism is concerned, looking back, I can see these kind of signposts sure. along the way. Um, a big moment was in eleventh grade. I had an American Lit teacher. It was her first year teaching. She was a Catholic, and I didn't know that at the time. And we were going through the journals of Cabeza de Vaca. And there's this beautiful prayer that we read in class, and we had to write about it. And perceiving her to be a Baptist, and I was going to, you know, pander, you can always take a pop shot at Catholics and get extra points if you've got a Baptist <laughs> teacher, right? So uh, I wrote this priest scathing review, like, why are these people praying to God? I thought, why didn't they just say a few Hail Marys? Or so? I don't even know what I wrote. It was terrible. <laughs> but it was around the same time that Pope John Paul II had recently died. And she got up the next day, was passing out the papers, and she said, well, Trey, since you're such an expert on Catholicism, the Holy Father has just passed away, and I knew I was cooked then, right? She said, Holy Father, what? where am I at right now? Mm -hmm. And she said, I, why don't you follow the proceedings of the election of a new pope? And so in 11th grade, I had to write this paper over what was going on whenever Pope Benedict came came into to the papacy. So I was kind of watching that as an 11th grader, kind of uh, uh, trying to uh, broad my worldview, but at the same time, right, I had still never really bumped up against anything that that I disagreed with. Um, and then I had another experience um, where a friend of mine that had already graduated and moved off, gone to college, he converted. 
and it was kind of a scandal in the youth group because he had been in the youth group, you know, and right. he was kind of a mutual friend of my wife and I. And so he came down and he was really steeped in all of the Catholic answers, uh, apologetic side of things. <laughs> right. And so every question I threw at him, he had a good, solid answer for. So I kind of, even though I, I still kind of dismissed Catholics, I still kind of would concede, well, they are Christians. They're just kind of kooky Christians that are wrong on some stuff, right. you know. But that was kind of the turning point yeah. in my in my mind. Would you say, were there any particular kookiness, <laughs> aspects of kookiness that, that stuck out in your mind in particular? That would have been barriers for you or were <sighs> barriers for you? Well, I had, I had five huge reasons. One of the reasons that I ended up not becoming a Methodist preacher was because of baptism. Mm -hmm. I really believed in believer's baptism, and it took a while to work through that. Um, prayers to saints, especially uh, to Mary, was something that was troublesome and probably one of the most misunderstood aspects of Catholicism. And, and there's some people that you meet that don't know how to defend it. And so if, if they don't and they can't articulate it properly, sometimes they can make the situation even worse. Right. So um, there was that um, physical presence of Christ in the Eucharist. You got to be kidding me, right? Like, surely that can't be real. So there were, there were these and there were, there were some others too. I, uh, confession was an issue for me. And um, I'm trying to remember what what <laughs> obviously it wasn't too big of a deal because I can't remember what my other but yeah those those were some big those were like the big four mm -hmm. for me um, and it still made it pretty easily dismissible sure. sure well maybe we'll return to those and, and just break them up uh, break them apart a little bit more but what what really opened you then to start looking at the church at this po point in your life um, so. As we kind of uh, explored these different traditions, my, we visited several different churches after I quit pastoring. I pastored for about a year and, you know, trying to pastor a church. And, and it was kind of like the type of church where here's the keys. You know, you can mow the yard if you want. And, <laughs> you know, you kind of do everything. Huh. And they're kind of like, does your wife play the piano? So <laughs> uh, after after that experience, which that was just like total... Uh, burnout, and I was like 20 at the time, 19 or 20. Wow. I was a college student. Uh, I was already a barber at this point in time, and I actually went to barber college so that I could have uh, a trade to fall back on because I planned on going to seminary. Right. And uh, so I was already running a business full time. We've got two little kids, and so we just kind of had to step back from that. And I kept supply preaching. That lasted for, like I said, close to seven, eight, nine years. And uh, we went back to the church that I had grown up in. Um, we didn't leave that church because we had any sort of like major theological differences or philosophical differences or because we got mad because they changed the color of the carpet or anything like that. But there was just kind of this sense of... Uh, we needed something different. And so we began to kind of visit different churches. Um, I had a friend that was kind of uh, charismatic. He he had just taken over church. We went and visited there for a while. That wasn't going to be our cup of tea. And uh, I actually landed in a Presbyterian church for a while. So I went from like one end of the spectrum to the other as far right. as like the whole Armenianism, Calvinism debate. Right. And... Uh, and I was engaging with those different theological points at the same time. Um, but like I said, ultimately it came down to um, just not really feeling like we had found our home. And right. so we actually fell out of church for a time, about a, a year, year and a half that we weren't in church. And so... I, I came to my wife and I said, we, we have got to get our act together here. We got to get our kids in church. Um, we've always had our kids in church. And I'm going to let you pick. If you don't pick, if you don't pick one, we're going here. And I had just kind of, even though 
I thought, yeah, it's not perfect, but it's the way I was raised and all that stuff. I had kind of picked this little Southern Baptist church, you know. And she said, well, why don't we try the Catholic church? Now, where the heck did that come from? <laughs> <laughs> well, I, so my wife is very reserved. Uh -huh. she's, she's, a, she's a very quiet person. Yeah. She likes solitude. And so I think that she was kind of attracted to the order, having grown up in, in a very free, uh, charismatic kind of uh, tradition. She was, I think, probably as a child, like nervous the entire time at church because you never knew really what was going to be going on. And I think she just really liked structure. Okay. So I think she was drawn to that and, and just the idea of a quiet, sacred space. And so... Um, I, I, we we kind of these were this was in 2019. Yeah. This was about this time of the year, yeah. in the fall of 2019. And I said, okay, well, how are we going to go do this? And she said, well, we'll wait until the first of the year. We'll just kind of set our plans. We're going to visit the Catholic Church at the first of the year. And I said, okay. So I started studying. That's where. That's kind of where the rubber met the road sure. for me at that point. Well, maybe that's a good place to take a quick break. Yeah. Okay, so we'll we'll come back and we'll hear how that how that played out. It, 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 it's amazing. Uh, you you mentioned that your wife is sort of reserved, so she was like Mary. She was pondering these things mm -hmm. in her heart, and and the, at the right moment, the Holy Spirit set you on a new path. Yeah. So that's neat. We'll hear more about that in just a minute. So, uh, thanks again for being here. We'll be back in just a minute to hear the rest of Trey's story. Uh, I want to remind you, as always, that if you're on a journey, we'd like to journey with you. We'd like to be praying for you. We'd like to answer questions if you have them. But most of all, we'd just like to encourage you to keep asking those questions, seeking the truth, and uh, we'd love to invite you to become Catholic. So uh, check out chnetwork.org. We've got lots of stories, newsletter, a community, and people who would love to help you along the journey. So we'll be back in just a minute to hear the rest of Trey's story. See you then. Welcome back to the Journey Home program. This is the second half of tonight's uh, hour, tonight's story. We're with uh, Trey Plummer. He's a former Southern Baptist preacher. Uh, and Trey, I really enjoyed your story so far. Uh, thanks for sharing it with us. And so when, when we left off for the break, your wife had just su surprised you with the suggestion mm -hmm. that uh, in, your, in your wandering, in your guys' searching as a, as a couple, as a family, that you check out the Catholic Church. Yeah. That's yeah. pretty wild. Yeah. Well, so I, I had kind of explained how... Mm -hmm. Uh, I had become less uncatholic. I don't really know how to yeah. you know, word open. that. Oh, more open, yeah. maybe. But I, I, I've got some like looking back, some specific points mm -hmm. that I feel like kind of prepared me for that. Um, one, of course, was my teacher in high school, but right. also um, somewhere in high school, I ended up watching that old uh, brother, son, sister moon. <laughs> <laughs> right, uh, St. Francis movie, and I fell in yeah. love with St. Francis. Yeah. And maybe it was to kind of be kind of edgy, but when I graduated from high school, there, that we had to fill out these papers that they put in the paper, you know, the local paper, and it was like, who would you like to eat dinner with, or something, or what would you like to do with that person? And I, I wrote something like, uh, I'd like to eat with St. Francis, and then watch him preach to the birds, or something like that. And it was probably just to, just to kind of get under the ire of the local Baptist friends of mine or something, <laughs> kind of being rebellious. But no, I, I think that I really did develop a pretty profound appreciation for certain things very gradually. I, I worked at a Bible bookstore when I was in college, and we had a priest that would come in and buy greeting cards. They were always like, get well, cards or missed you cards and his name was Father Henry. I can't pronounce his last name. He's Polish and it was like this long. <laughs> and uh, Father Henry was like, I really felt like, man, this guy is the most Christ-like person I have ever seen. And I, I, was, I was struck with that impression from the moment I met him 
because he was like the embodiment of humility and, and meekness. And um, one of the one of the ladies that I worked with I always said, oh, hello, Father. And then everybody would make fun of her because, you know, it was, it was a Protestant Bible store. As a matter of fact, if you came in and asked for a Catholic Bible, we would tell people, no, this is a Christian bookstore, <laughs> right. you know, to make that distinction. But uh, Father Henry had a, a really profound effect on me. I actually wrote him a letter when I was in RCIA explaining to him my journey, and he wrote me back. And uh -huh. so, yeah, he's still living. He's 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 advanced in years, but he's still got the same sweet spirit. Uh -huh. Also, when I was at the Bible bookstore, um, Zondervan was a brand that we carried, and they did these like um, like Christian biographies, and they they had one on Mother Teresa. And they got rid of it, like they weren't going to sell it. And so I took it home, and my wife and I both read it. Yeah. And we were deeply impacted by her spirit. And actually in the airport on the way over here, I saw a couple um, sisters of charity in the airport. Uh -huh. I felt like I needed prayers in the Dallas airport. I didn't get to get to them, but I thought, man, I would love, just they carry that spirit with them too. Right. Um, but... So yeah, there were there were little things like that along the way that just kind of chipped away at that kind of wall that we had kind of sure. built for ourselves. Um, so yeah, back to back to her dropping the the bomb on me there. <laughs> I don't think that either one of us planned on converting. I think that she was content with sitting on the banks of the Tiber. Nobody wanted to swim it, right? We were just going to like be total salad bar Catholics. We don't even have to call ourselves Catholics. We're just going to go and we're going to take in this quiet reverence and, you know, we're going to just see what's going on there and get a feel for the place. And if we like it, we'll stay and we can just sit in the back and, you know, just be a part right, in right. as limited capacity as we can. So my children's godparents are converts, too and um, actually related to him, Mike and Laurie Richardson. And so I called, I called Mike and I said, hey, they'd been Catholics this time probably five, six, seven years. Okay. And I said, uh, Mike, y'all still at the Catholic Church? And he said, yeah, yeah. And I said, uh, do you have any regrets? <laughs> or something <laughs> along those lines. And he said, he said, no, Trey, I've never looked back. And I said, what do I need to do? And he said, I just come and don't feel any pressure to do anything. Just sit and just soak it all in. Just come and experience the Mass, which is great, great advice. And so this was probably, like I said, it was in the fall. And I told him, I was like, we're going to wait till the first of the year. You know, I don't know why we had this date, but I think that we thought, well, if we land in Advent, you know, like with all of the 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 Christmas festivities and stuff going on. I don't know if we thought that would lure us in or whatever. We just kind of wanted to, we didn't realize that uh, Advent lasted until <laughs> after the first of the year at the time. Right. Um, so I, I, I began to to read and to start watching some, some YouTube videos of, from the Catholic Answers guys. And I actually started watching The Journey Home about that time and come across people like Steve Ray and Scott Hahn. And from right. then, from that moment, it was like, well, I guess I'm already a Catholic, you know. <laughs> um, but all the while, with with my wife still kind of like, well, she's the one that's talking about going, but I don't know how serious she is about actually, you know. And so then when we when we ended up going on the on the first Sunday of 2020, um, we were met by Mike and Laurie, and we were greeted taken in one of the first people that i saw was that american lit teacher she's still in my town still goes to mass at our parish saint jude thaddeus and uh everybody took us in and we were like my wife was was hooked she was like that's great and i felt like my dead ancestors were going to come out of the grave and get me <laughs> like oh my goodness i have set in on this idolatrous thing and because you know like during the elevation of the host um, you know, you've got, you've got bells going off. You've got kneelers pulled out. People are knelt down. I was totally freaked out. Yeah. Like I, I didn't kneel the first, uh, probably couple months. I just kind of sitting there just kind of looking around like, 
these people are actually worshiping this bread and this wine. Like, you can say whatever you want about it, the other stuff. I, it was pretty obvious that nobody's worshiping saints here, right? right? And some of the other things I was starting to kind of get a handle on, but I, I couldn't like, that was something that was very obvious and right. it was something that I, I couldn't really wrap my head around right. just yet. It's either true or it's a horrible Exactly. Idolatrous, scandalous uh, yeah. thing. Either this yeah. is, either this is the <laughs> fullness of truth. Yeah. Or these people are in grave, idolatrous error. Right. And so that kind of forced. That kind of forced a decision, and whenever you accept that as the truth, you can't be a salad bar Catholic anymore. And it became obvious that if we do believe that's true and we do desire that, then we can't just sit on the banks. We've got to swim the Tiber, right? So uh, at that point, we kind of expressed to our priest at the time, Father Raj, uh, and he actually went back to India. His mother passed away. He, he was so good for us coming in. He was, he was very simplistic with his homilies and just a very warm and loving priest and we hit it off immediately and he told me from the very beginning slow down hmm. you know take your time there's no rush and little did I know he's going to put me in an RCA that let la RCIA that lasted for like a year <laughs> and uh, when we got into RCIA our uh, RCIA director Catherine Phillips she actually was my sponsor when I came into the church and she's been a uh, and unwilling at times kind of spiritual director for me, um, she would like purposefully kind of question me on things because by the time we got to RCIA, I had read enough and I had kind of made that choice that, yeah, this is the truth. And I, I kind of felt like, yeah, I got this thing. I'm ready to go. And she would, she would challenge me with stuff. And well, all of us, it was a, it was a good RCIA group. And, um, I, I really, at that point in my life, um, looking back, and we were COVID Catholics, so we didn't get to do anything normally. Right. Half of this RCIA was Zoomed. The new category, COVID Catholics. Yeah. Uh, and, and I mean, you look back at all the pictures on the Easter Vigil when we came in and we're all wearing masks and you can't see anybody's face. And um, the uh, Father Raj actually got permission to do our confirmation from the bishop. Um, because we, you know, everything was kind of shut down. And we actually, when they shut down the parishes, we were kind of displaced for a while. And I was in contact with Father Raj, and whenever they gave the kind of, you guys can start coming back, we're just going to have to social distance and all this stuff. I, I called him and I told him, I said, Father, we can't take the sacrament. So why don't we make room for maybe some some other people that that can, and he said, "No, you're going to be here," and that was probably one of the the greatest areas of growth between my wife and I during that period because it was so quiet. There was no music. It was it was so intimate because it was such a small group. A, a lot of times it was the, uh, Mike and Laurie, our, our children's godparents, and and just a couple other people because we've got a lot of elderly parishioners and. Nobody really knew how to handle this pandemic, right? There's no right. rules for that. So it was just such a small group. And and just all this time, this desire is growing yeah. uh, to, to take the Eucharist. And during that time, when I, like I said, whenever, whenever you get to the point where you decide that this is either truth or this is, this is not, I'd found a, a Peter Kreef video who's been on this show before too. And he said, if you've got doubts, go sit on the first pew and look at the sanctuary lamp. That signifies Christ's presence is really there. Ask God for faith to believe that. Ask Christ to reveal himself to you. And I did that in the context of that quiet, you know, pandemic shutdown church kind of situation. We've got caution tape on every other row of pews, right. you know, and in that moment, God did change my heart. 
And this was right before we went into RCA. But um, yeah, that was kind of that turning point. Yeah. I think, and my wife, yet like I said, she was with me every step of the way. Right. Yeah. So you'd been opened to uh, open to the Catholic faith, and you'd clearly worked through some of the intellectual barriers enough to say that this isn't, or this this could be true, right? This it's possible that Christ given us Himself in the Eucharist. You know, but the question is, is it is it really true, right? And then the, that last step is mm. is a question of faith, a, a gift of God. Mm. You give me the gift of being able to believe this unbelievable thing, right? And if it's true, the beauty in that, you know, you look at all the other religions of the world, you've got Buddha and Muhammad, and they gave us their mind, Christ gave us his body. And just the weight of that, um, just, and I still, to this day, I... I pray that it never becomes uh, normal when when I get into the communion line and the priest holds up the the host and says the body of Christ. It's still it's still an emotional moment, and I hope that I never get used to it to where it becomes commonplace. And I try not to look around at what other people are doing during that time frame, and I know that. There are Catholics that, you know, you read the statistics that belief in the physical presence in the Eucharist is at all time low or whatever. But that's that's the source and the summit of our of our faith. And that right. that for me, like I was talking about earlier, being in the hall and quit camping in the hall, yeah. right? And then you realize that the whole house is Catholicism, right? All these rooms are just different, different schisms off of that. Mm-hmm. Because that's that's the heart of Catholicism is in the Eucharist, right? And Christ's gift of Himself to us, right? Well, um, so you became Catholic, yeah. Yeah, talk us through that and what happened after that. Yeah, so <clears throat> go back to the RCA process for a while. Um, I, I learned patience there because when I did make that mental switch, I was just I was ready, but. Our priest thought it'd be good for your whole family to come in together. And my, my youngest daughter at the time was just turning seven, which in the eyes of the church, that's an adult. And so all of my children made their own decision to uh, come into the church with us. My, my two daughters were baptized. Um, and so Easter Vigil was, it was a beautiful night. You know, my daughters were baptized. We all had First Communion. We all were, uh, received confirmation on the same night. Beautiful. Yeah, and uh, leading up to that point, um, you still wrestle with, you know, what are people going to think? You know, I was I was kind of a kind of a closet Catholic there too. There was uh, there was enough of a lack of an interaction because of COVID that nobody really knew we were doing this thing. But then by the time that Easter Vigil was coming around. It was uh, it was Easter in 2021, and so things were just starting to kind of open back up. And it's like, oh no, now I've got to fill all of these questions about being a Catholic. Right. Um, had you had there been an interruption in the in the preaching circuit because of COVID? Oh, so I, I had quit preaching okay. about the time. Actually, that's actually kind of a funny story too. I had quit preaching about the time that I said that we were not in church. But being a barber and having this, these different connections with people, I ended up doing a lot of weddings and funerals yeah. just because I was kind of like a community you know, person. So right. if they didn't have any sort of a church affiliation, they are like, well, trail marry us or trail bury dad or whatever. So I actually did a, a wedding while we were in RCIA. And I asked Father Raj, I said, can I do this wedding? And he said, was it between a man and a woman? I was like, what kind of weddings do you think that Baptists do? And uh, he said, yeah. He said, this is your last one, though. Okay. And then we're a little bit closer to the end of that RCIA journey whenever my grandmother passed away. And she wanted me to do her funeral. I asked about that. I said, do I need to be doing this funeral. And he said, listen, you can't be a representative 
in another faith community when you belong to this one. Mm-hmm. He said, but this is a family issue. You're not a Catholic yet. Mm-hmm. You know, like I told you, slow down, take care of your family, and then you're done after this. This is your last one. So yeah. that was kind of my last. And I've had people ask me since <laughs> since I've become a Catholic, so can you, can you uh, marry us? And it's like, uh, I'm a Catholic. It's okay. Can you marry us? And it's like, no, I can't do that. Now. Wow. So that's that's been kind of an interesting that's thing interesting. too, because I think it, still in some people's mind, it's becoming less and less probably. Um, that's still kind of part of my identity because I did that for so long, and right. even myself. I that's one thing my wife asked me. She said, "Are you? Is it going to bother you? I don't know if that's the right way to put it that." you know, that part of your life is, is over. And I actually went to a diaconate formation meeting Mm -hmm. shortly after, um, conversion because I thought, I still feel this call on my life. What am I supposed to, to do with this now? And, um, I was talking, like I said, to my, uh, unwilling spiritual director and she, she said, it's probably doable unless you guys had another baby. And then like a week later, we found out we were having our fourth baby. So I thought, well, that, that door, not that that can't be done, but that door's kind of going to be more difficult to go through mm-hmm. at this time. But now, um, after conversion, and I think this is probably something that, um, that this ministry deals with, with pastors and with preachers. What do you do after? I mean, for me, it was an identity thing, but I was always a bivocational pastor. Right. I, I never, I never preached when I wasn't a barber, right? But there's still that that draw or that calling or whatever you want to to teach and to to be a part to right. serve the church in some capacity. And I think that my entire adult life has kind of been working towards that intersection of faith and and work and being able to put those two things together. And so that's difficult for some people to, but I, I've actually, uh, since I had to drop out last time, I missed a flight and couldn't get here. Since then I found out that I, I, I actually have a position teaching in a Catholic school starting oh, next school year. So Congratulations. Yeah, yeah. So that's gonna be a new and exciting chapter for our family too. And I've found uh, as hard as it's going to be to leave my little parish, um, there's, there's, I've already found new mentors. Uh, John Rocha is the, the headmaster of the school, and he's already become uh, a mentor type for me, kind of took me under his wing. And that was something as a preacher I, I always needed, but never really had somebody. And in the context of the Catholic Church, I've had so many people come and put their arm around me and say, you know, let's walk through this together. Right. And so that's been a, that's been a huge part of my conversion as well. Right. That situation, as you said, is, is something that we see a lot at the Coming Home Network International. You know, my, my father originally started the apostolate particularly to focus on helping pastors, you know, and now, now we help anyone who's thinking about becoming Catholic, but still that focus on uh, someone who felt a call, which we believe is, you know, there's a real call there into ministry, into, into serving uh, the church. Uh, And so then once you become Catholic, it's a different discernment process, you know, Um, in some sense, like everybody has that same, has a call. Absolutely. Right. But the person who's already been involved in ministry, they're more sensitive to the fact that, yeah, Lord, I want to know how I'm called to put these gifts that you've given me into action. And so they're more sensitive to, yeah. I want to figure that out, I want to discern that, right? Yeah. So that's that's great to hear that, that position. Yeah, but I, I, I will say that this period in between when I found out that this position was going to be open, right, um, gave me an opportunity to really reflect, okay, not like disassociating myself with, with my... Uh, uh, being a, a preacher or anything like that, but about my status as a married person, right? right, And what the church's call is in that vocation. Right. 
And so I've really had an opportunity to look at what it means to be a Catholic husband and a Catholic father. And that's, yeah. of course, we got a new baby. Yeah. And uh, that's been an entirely different dynamic because I think that uh, a preacher, a Protestant preacher, they kind of juggle those dual vocations. Not that it, you know, but it's difficult. Yeah. And sometimes, and a lot of times, the family takes kind of the back seat to that. And so kind of bringing them to the forefront and recognizing that this is where God's placed me in this state at this moment and walking in that has been, I think, an area for growth yeah. in, in our entire family. I think that's huge. It's such an important point. Yeah, yeah because every, every, if we're called to that vocation, yeah. um, it's a real vocation. It's a, it's a primary adventure we're called to, yeah. to be on with the our domest- spouses. The domestic church, right? Right. And we know that, you know, ultimately the way that God changes the world is through saints, through the people who decide simply to give their lives fully to him, to follow him wherever he leads. And saints come from holy families, yeah. right? Fathers and mothers who, who really give and sacrifice to bring the faith to their children. So yeah. it's no small thing. Right. <laughs> Absolutely. It's, that, it, that is, that is our, our calling as, as husbands and fathers is to, to raise our children in the fear and admonition of the Lord and to... You know, every child is uh, has a right to a religious education, and that doesn't just mean in the context of the school, but it's our it's our calling to to catechize our kids and to to raise them in the faith. And I think that that's probably something that I've I've noticed. We can talk a lot about um, problems in the, the hierarchy as far as you know, like the formation people, the lack of formation, but that starts at home, right? And I, that's that's my job. That's your job. Mm-hmm. And if we don't take that seriously, then we've we've gotten things unbalanced. Yeah. You know. So whenever I want to, you know, like get upset about something, I can always go look in the mirror, right? right. <laughs> yeah. And as far as that's concerned, I, uh, if somebody says something negative about uh, the Pope or or something like that, I always say, you know. Uh, Every Protestant's his own pope, and I did a terrible job in my own life. So, <laughs> I, <laughs> I can, I'm glad that that's not that's not my job, yeah. and, and my my calling is is to my family. Yeah. So, and God works through that, you know, in yeah. ways that we can't. That's part of the point is that we can't see the fruit that He could bring out of us just being faithful in yeah. our vocations that we have. We've got just about two and a half minutes left. Yeah. Would you just take a moment to again stepping back into your in your story? Um, if someone's listening right now who maybe comes from some of the backgrounds you did, maybe, they, maybe they're in that middle way of, of seeing the different doorways yeah. and seeing some good, some positives, but also seeing the, the, the dividedness. What, what's a word of encouragement that you might give them? Yeah, well, you have to at least, uh, if, if Catholicism is a desire on your heart, you have to at least concede that maybe it's the Holy Spirit that's drawing me to this. And then the wisdom that I got from, from Mike Richardson, my uh, children's godfather, come and experience the Mass. And then like Peter Kreef said, sit on the front row and recognize that that, that, that that Christ's presence is physically there. We believe that. You know, Pray for faith to believe that and ask God to reveal Himself to you there. And then Father Raj, slow down. You know, Take your time. So I look back and I, I got a lot of good godly wisdom during my uh, formation process. And be careful with the media that you consume. Um, I think that that's something that I was very fortunate. You know, during COVID, we were all shut down. Um, but listen to the right voices. You know, this is a great resource for, for people that are discerning. Uh, and there's there's others, but you can get, you can get in some murky water too. Sure. So yeah. just prayerfully discern. And God will, God will open the doors that, that you need. Very good. Well, thank you so much, Trey, for sharing you. your story and yeah. your wisdom with us. And thank you for being us, with us uh, tonight on the Journey Home program. Again, one of the things that always touches me about these stories, right, is that you know, the reason to even be on that journey, to ask the questions, to persevere through the end, is because we've come to know Jesus. And He's who uh, we're, we're pursuing, we're listening to, we're trying to obey. And so wherever you are in your particular journey, whether you're someone who's thinking about becoming Catholic or you've been a Catholic all your life, stay close to Jesus. Persevere in prayer. You know, he'll lead you. Uh, thanks again for joining us for this episode. 
Uh, God bless you. We'll be again with you next week to share more of these stories of how God has led his children home to the Catholic faith. God bless you.